and welcome back to another episode of Power People and Planet. I'm Kumi Naidu, and this is a series of conversations tackling the biggest questions of our time. Today, I'm joining you from the German Alps, two hours outside of Munich, where I'm part of the Richard von Weizsäcker Forum, which is looking at the impact of climate change and tourism here in uh, Germany and in Europe. And that's why I'm not in studio. However, I am so, so very pleased to have three people I respect deeply and who've inspired my own activism, Georgia Hursty, Naomi Klein, and Laura Garcia, on the topic of intersectionality in the activist movements of today. Let me introduce uh, our guest to you first. So starting with Georgia, she's a co-founder and executive director of Frailty Mits, a community-rooted diversity, equity, and inclusion organization that uses hands-on activities and the principles of practice to transform oppressive cultures and advance justice. Georgia has worked extensively with Greenpeace and across social and environment movements in a variety of leadership roles with a focus on direct action, empowerment, and a deep interest in long-term behavior change. She has trained thousands of people in skills ranging from climbing to welding and conflict resolution to leadership. All of her work grows from the ethos that we must practice being in the new world we want to live in so as not to replicate destructive patterns. And I should say, uh, in the context of transparency, one of my engagements with Georgia when I was at Greenpeace was when we were occupying the rig in Russia, she was spraying me fully with the the water cannon to prepare me for being sprayed by the water cannon by Gazprom, and that was not a very good experience. <laughs> <laughs> and Naomi Klein, our second guest, who is well known in uh, um, activist circles around the world, is an award-winning journalist, columnist, and international best-selling author of eight books, uh, most of which we are familiar with, No Logo, The Shock Doctrine, this changes everything, and I was happy to be at the launch for that with you, Naomi. Uh, no is n not enough and on fire, which has been translated in over 35 languages. She is a senior contributing writer for The Intercept. She was the inaugural Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University and is now Honorary Professor of Media and Climate at Rutgers. In September 2021, she joined the University of British Columbia as UBC Professor of Climate Justice and is the founding co-director of the UBC Center for Climate Justice. Welcome, Naomi. Laura Garcia is a feminist activist who has advocated for human rights, social justice, and civil society throughout her career. Before joining Global Green Grants as CEO, where she currently is, Laura served for seven years as the executive director of Fondo Semelas, a Mexican nonprofit organization that finances grassroots organizations to achieve gender equality. Laura has co created networks to promote community philanthropy in the global south. She holds a master's degree in international peace and security from King's College London. And she currently serves on the boards of Oxfam Mexico, Co-Impact, and the Global Fund for Community Foundations. Georgia, Naomi, Laura, thank you so very much for joining me today to speak about what I think is one of the most urgent issues facing activism, and that is the need to turbocharge sectional intersectionality. So let me just start with the introductory question to each of you. What does intersectionality mean to each of you? Georgia, if I can kick off with you. Sure. Thanks, Kumi, and, and thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you. You know, at Frailty Mist, we think a lot about intersectionality in terms of how we hold the kind of real urgency of needing action on structural racism and climate change and preventing harm uh, while not continuing to perpetuate hurtful cultures of white supremacy that are wrapped in this idea of franticness and rigidness and burnout. And so we think of intersectionality um, as, you know, the lens that we understand how to advance climate and social justice through how we carry out the work, who we're empowering to lead, and actually listening to and being guided by the lived experience of those that are most impacted by, by the, the systems, of, uh, systems of oppression we live under. Additionally, as far as intersectionality, I think kind of the elephant in the room when we talk about intersectionality is really who we're 
who we're talking to and asking the people who have the power to see, even if it's for the first time, how the systems that they support have created the destructive and harmful system that we live under and to step aside rather than putting that burden on the people who are experiencing the oppression from the way that intersectionality acts upon them. Thank you, Georgia. That's a good, great start. Laura, do you want to follow with, I'm sure there's lots of overlaps there, yeah. but uh, your take on intersectionality? Sure. For me, um, Kumi, intersectionality is probably the most complete or comprehensive analysis of power and the oppressive systems that we're trying to, to tackle in, in social change or, or social justice uh, work. It calls on how dominant structures of intersect with one with one another, and with that, uh, we come to the conclusion, or we start seeing that people have different uh, layers of identities and conditions uh, throughout their lives. So it allows for every person to be accounted for, but it also allows for the different layers of oppression to be analyzed and to be identified in a single person. Uh, a person, we could have a person that is conditioned uh, because of her identity as female, but also her identity as indigenous, her identity as black, her identity as poor, her identity as coming from a colonized um, uh, 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 background, for example. And we can also experience oppression and privilege at the same time, which is something that has been a struggle within some movements, right? As I'm, I'm com I come from the feminist movement and, and we see a lot of struggles with um, uh, feminist agendas that are not intersecting enough with, for example, um, um, black feminism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that inter intersectionality is not only a powerful tool of analysis or research in terms of uh, understanding power structures and oppression, but it's also an incredibly important tool for action. Uh, and, and in social action, we see uh, intersectionality playing an extremely important role for what I know Naomi will probably begin to speak about this big tent that we need to that we need to um, to where we need to gather all of the different forces and movements together in an intersectional way if we want to really achieve social justice and equality for all. Thank you so much, Laura. So, so Naomi, um, when uh you launched This Changes Everything. I remember what emerged out of that was people saying, to change everything, we need everybody to be involved. So Laura has given you a segue into that idea. Over to you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, these are great definitions. And, um, and, and so I, I think... Kumi, thinking about that, 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 that it takes everyone, I think what, what that, that is an analysis of power, really, you know, that what we're talking about is changing the building blocks of society when, when we think about actually what it would take to respond to the climate crisis, but so many overlapping and intersecting crises that we face. I think the intersectionality lens in a movement context says this is not just about kind of turning us ourselves into a movement blob that erases differences. Um, but it, 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 it understands that if we are going to come together in solidarity, we have to understand the differences that people bring into every space, right? I mean, the term intersectionality comes from a legal context um, and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw in sort of in analyzing the lived experiences of Black women, um, working class that 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 don't comply with the way our world has been carved into issue boxes and silos. Like so, so um, that it, people don't enter a space just as a woman. Um, if you are a Black working class queer woman, you're bringing all of that into that space, right? Um, but I think if we if we look at it from a from a movement perspective, I think what we're talking about is sort of weaving the world back together from this legacy of compartmentalization, which has a really, really deep history um, in the, you know, I get into some of this in the shock doctrine around the way that funders um, like the Ford Foundation um, responded to um, 
socialist movements that were attacked in the 1960s and 70s through the Chicago School, which was funded by the Ford Foundation. And then when the attacks on the social movements in Latin America were revealed to be these horrific human rights atrocities, these same foundations funded human rights organizations and legal organizations to kind of pick up the pieces from the attacks on socialism, right? So I don't think we can really understand this without understanding like how we broke apart in the first place, right? That social movements used to think about a coherent worldview that they were fighting for, and that was very threatening to power, right? To, to fight for socialism. And it was attacking that, that process was extremely violent around the world, in the global South in particular, but not only in the global South. And then the legacy became human rights, women's rights, racial justice, environmentalism, and all these little boxes. And then you have layering on, on top of that, a scholarship that says, wait a minute, this isn't how people live, right? Like, like power intersects. And so now I think we're in the, in the stage of kind of picking the pieces up and, 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 and weaving theory that actually reflects how people live. But I think it's important to know that sort of history and context. That's a little piece of it, anyway. yeah. Yeah, no, thanks very much for bringing that in. So, so let me just share with you a perspective, right? It occurs to me that right now, probably most people in NGOs, in trade unions, in philanthropy even, in foundations today, are all paying lip service to intersectionality. There's nobody who's saying, actually, we can continue to operate in the silos that funding or other factors actually created. So my sense on your reflections, right? What do you think holds back uh, the activist community, whether it's leaders or, or not, to fully embrace intersectionality? What is holding us back uh, to actually move in that direction? Uh, Laura, do you want to give it a shot? Sure. Um, What's holding so us back? I'll, I'll, I'll start with um, the, the work that I'm doing today in um, environmental justice uh, at Global Green Grants, where we fund uh, grassroots movements working for environmental justice issues around the world. And I would actually challenge you, Kumi, to, with the assumption that um, philanthropy is already either paying lip service or uh, paying and like uh, focusing on intersectionality. Uh, Although a lot of um, human rights-based philanthropy is already doing that, in the environmental movement, we still see very much a conservation-based environmental perspective that is not intersectional at its core. The origins of, uh, for example, the U.S. environmental movement, we know that it's, it's, uh, it's from a white supremacist view that certain pristine or virgin, because they weren't even virgin, they were, there were indigenous communities there, that certain pristine areas uh, should, have, should be protected. But when we see the rationale behind it, they, these protective areas were um, based uh, or mostly um, defended for the em enjoyment of white people in power that um, that did not question and in fact were advancing urban industrialization and and this separation of people and nature is also part of the problem here uh, the problem in climate justice philanthropy and in environmental philanthropy is that we still have a very structural misunderstanding of people and planet uh, and that prevents us from looking uh, at intersectional perspectives and to be including uh, people within in all of its inters in all of their intersections as part of the solutions I think that we're kind of a long way from that uh, the the western relationship of nature is broken and I think that that's part of the problem because if we were and, and also part of the solution is intersectionality because when we start including different populations such as the indigenous population to not only continue stewarding the, the land as they are already doing it but but to lead 
climate agendas uh, with, with a new framework and a new mindset of how we relate to nature and how we are part of nature, I think that's, the, that's where the solution are. But we are far from, from that still. And philanthropy in numbers tell us that uh, less than 0.2% of, of funding goes to women and the environment, despite the fact that women environmental uh, leaders are leading the fight in many areas of the world against extractivism, protecting land, and movements also need to be uh, more intersectional, uh, as, as, I, as we sometimes see, for example, uh, in indigenous communal lands, uh, women are not allowed to participate in the communal assemblies. And that is a key vulnerability to defending territory. Uh, so we need to pay attention to intersectionalities at, at all levels. But by far, grassroots movements are already behaving in a much more intersectional way than philanthropy, for example, uh, like Naomi was saying. So we definitely need to put philanthropy up to speed in, in intersectionality. But I think that because, because social justice issues are and rights issues are ever evolving, intersectionalities are uh, being discovered more and more. We are discovering how important is it to have a disability rights based rights approach, for example, to understand climate solutions and, and combat ableism as a climate solution in itself. But this is fairly new to some movements, uh, and, and we see that uh, happening in Green Grant. So, part of the I, I guess part part of the challenge is for all of us to work together in this evolutionary process of learning how we intersect all with. Uh, systems of oppression. And if systems of oppression are intersectional in themselves, why wouldn't the fight be, right? We, we need to intersect Absolutely. the fight a lot more to be able to, 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 to make sure that social change happens in the most efficient way. Laura, thank you so much for that response. And also thanks for correcting me there. I think I was being a bit too optimistic that they are at least paying lip service. You're right. <laughs> Many are not even. And, and you know, you, you just confirmed for me what I said more than 10 years ago, that actually we live in a world where there's far too little philanthropy and too much philanthropy. <laughs> F-O-O-L. <laughs> uh, because, you know, we must use this occasion of this podcast actually to call on the people in the foundation world to actually really pick up their, pull up their socks on this issue. Uh, there's, obviously, we can't homogenize it. It's a wide variety of different responses. But that statistic you give in a context where we are running out of time to avert catastrophic climate change is a statistic where less than 2% is going to environmental and uh, funding women is a statistic that needs to be changed very urgently. Georgia, your reflection? I saw you nodding in agreement. <laughs> a, a couple of things, yeah. I, you know, firstly, I think what is interesting to me about paying lip service to that to intersectionality is that I do think that there's lip service to the word that unfortunately loses leaves some of the concept behind. And so I think, particularly in the environmental movement, we see intersectionality instead uh, people being inclined to use that word to represent multiple perspectives rather than what Kimberly Crenshaw meant, which was the kind of compounding effect that these overlapping systems of discrimination and disadvantage have. And so I think it's a real danger for our analysis of power when we mix it, mix it up conceptually. And I think uh, additionally, to continue on the, this uh, conversation, uh, the relationship that Laura brought up about hu humanity and the broken relationship with the planet, there's also, I think, a really broken relationship between humanity and time. And so when we think about how we move our movements forward and the kind of urgency and, and franticness that white supremacy has inflicted and forced upon our cultures, it doesn't allow us the time to analyze the people that we're reaching out to through an intersectional land intersectional lens. And that psychologically creates unsafe situations for people, unsafe places for people. And our movements lose power. They lose uh, community. And I think we end up in the long term because we don't, we're so focused on urgency that we don't take the time to cultivate the kind of powerful intersectional relationships that are necessary to really reach the place that we need to reach. Um, and it's keeping people out of our movements and the people that are the most impacted by the injustices by climate change, by racism, by sexism. And those are the folks we need the most. And this kind of urgency that we're creating 
um, by not acknowledging this intersectional lens, I think is is really doing us a disservice in the long run. Naomi, do you want to give your reflection on why is it we can't break through? What's holding us back? Well, not to be like that sort of, you know, socialist, but <laughs> I do believe that a lot of, if, we're, if you know, if this is a conversation about philanthropy, you know, philanthropy tends to represent capital, like where's the money from? Um, and so, frankly, I think that adopting a discourse of intersectionality, and I think that there has been some of that, I do think that I've certainly seen that. And, and you know, I take Laura's point that it's not, it's not, um, you know, there's lots of areas where there's not even that lip service, but there certainly is lip service that's happening. And there certainly is a kind of a minimal sort of tokenism that philanthropy would be happy to sort of adopt. Right. And, and so I think that, 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 that there's a difference between funding actual frontline communities, like funding the broad based organizations that represent indigenous movements and sort of what Odefemi Taiwu in his book, Elite Capture, which I would really, really recommend that folks read, um, you know, Olafemi Tau is a, 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 a philosophy um, a professor at Georgetown University. He's written this really, he's written two really great books in the past year. One is called Reconsidering Reparations, which looks at climate justice and reparations. And really a companion book, book is, is um, Elite Capture. I mean, they're related to one another because the book about reparations is really about these sort of structure, what it would structurally take to engage in what he refers to as world making, right? So reparations as world making, not just reparations as repair of past damage, but reparations as the means by which we create the next world, the new world, um, given that this world that we're in is failing, right? Um, but he also talks about what he, what he refers to as being in the room privilege, right? Like the idea that it's just about kind of changing who is in the room, but not changing the room. Um, and I think that philanthropy is much more kind of um, inclined to change, change who's in the room than change the room, than really looking at these sort of structural failures. Um, and and it's not to say it can't happen, but I don't think that philanthropy is necessarily going to be the engine of change here. I think that, you know, if we look at, I would love to hear Laura speak a, a little bit about the kind of like, the sort of mass movements that we see in Latin America, like membership-based movements that really can sort of shift the tides. That's, it's not just like applying for grants, which in and of itself, I think, lends itself to a kind of a... Um, Maybe, maybe what I'm referring, what, like we're referring to as tokenism, and and just kind of like changing the appearance of of who we're funding, but not actually shifting power. Thank you, Naomi. Naomi, uh, we did spend quite a bit of time on philanthropy, but let's let's shift it also to look at INGOs and Laura. Pick up the uh, question that uh, Naomi posed to you, but. I mean, let's ask the question, forget philanthropy for a second. How are NGOs, especially the big uh, logos that originate from the global north, uh, how are they doing? Well, I think that the big question with AI NGOs is the disconnect with social, um, with social uh, grassroots movements and their agendas. Uh, I, I think that's still a challenge. Many, many organizations... Um, such as Oxfam, uh, where I'm a board member of Oxfam Mexico, they they have been trying and acknowledging the importance of community um, community organizing and, and community led agendas for for building change. Uh, but I I think that in in certain ways they also replicate or are structured uh, from those systems that Naomi was referring to in philanthropy and. These are organizations who are having enormous challenges to, to really fit or align with the enormous dynamism and fluidity that happens in social movement organizing. Uh, that is very much informal in many ways. And, and to, to respond to Naomi's, um, to Naomi's invitation about um, talking, talking about membership movements in Latin America, we see, for example, youth activism in Chile as the main um, demonstrating that the 
what seemed like the impossible revolution to change the constitution became the inevitable one. And, and this is very much because of the power of youth organizing across the country who in who from one year to the other completely turned around things in Chile. And, and it, if we fail to bring leadership, that youth leadership at the negotiating table and at the leadership of movements themselves, we're doomed to failure. And this is why intersectionality is so important. And I also see, for example, the same thing happening with feminist movements in Latin America who have been organizing in a clandestine way, uh, networks of providing services uh, 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 to women of uh, in abortion uh, in context of militarization and prohibition and right-wing governments. And that tells us a lot about healing and reparation and what solidarity does and what the collective does uh, to, to social change. And um, I don't think that INGOs have been as effective in really um, demonstrating the support needed because structurally, I think that there's a disparity between where they are, institutionally speaking, and how movements behave. And, and movements behave in a much more intersectional way. I, I remember I spoke to you, Komi, last year when we also said that, yes, they are very much intersectional, but there's a lot to be done still. I think that there's a lot to be done, for example, in how the wisdom of healing and care in feminist movements and, and protection and collective security um, uh, taken away from a legal perspective of protecting, for example, feminist defenders to actually healing and providing safe spaces. There's a lot to be done on how we bring all of that into the environmental movement. And I'm speaking from a standpoint as, as a Mexican from um, having heard last week that Mexico became the country, the most um, um, dangerous country for environmental defenders. I think that environmental defenders and movements here in Mexico have a lot to learn from feminist um, uh, cultures of care and solidarity and where they have been engaging and trying to figure out how to protect themselves in contexts like um, uh, Nicaragua, for example. So there's a lot to be done there, but I do think that uh, the more that we integrate um, uh, Particip in a participatory way or models, community leadership and, and, and the people uh, that are affected by the problem in the solutions, the better we will be, especially with the climate crisis um, dooming in us. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I want to just shift it to Georgia and I want to stay a little bit with uh, the international NGOs for a second, because they are ones that occupy a lot of space. Where do you think, when we look at an organization like Greenpeace, how good are they doing? I think that that kind of idea that you just articulated around, you know, this language of mission drift is kind of just is just coded language for racism and sexism. What people are saying is we don't want to give up power structures and we don't want to give up our resources that are like deeply white. And, you know, it's like white affluent environmentalists. And, and it is, you know, what, one of the things that it, when I reflect on it, I find particularly um, sad and also kind of the antithesis to where we should be going is this, is, is the, the culture around decision-making, which in saying, well, we can't focus on race because it's mission drift. Um, is basically saying we don't trust people of color, frontline communities to make decisions that impact their lives with led by their lived experience. And so for me, when I, when I think about, and I, I totally agree that, you know, there are lots of people within Greenpeace and I'm sure these other organizations fighting, fighting for the right thing. And I think that part of this, this next step we need to take in that organizations like Greenpeace need to take is to really to really look at what it means to give up power and what it means to give up decision-making to the people who are actually being most impacted and follow their lead and their decision and their campaigning and give them the resources that they need uh, to make those decisions rather than hoarding them. And so, you know, I think they're particularly the large NGOs that have all of these resources are more, spending more time maintaining and hoarding those resources than actually doing the work that we need to do to deal with the with the, the crisis that we're in. 
And one of the things I find really inspiring is like, you know, some of the, some of the groups like movement for black lives that are really pushing philanthropy to say like, it is racist for you to come and say, you want to help advance the mission of, of black liberation and then tell us how to do it or put all these constraints on your money. That's not helping. So like, let us make the decisions or, or keep your money. And I think that's much more the lens we need to adopt. Thank you very much for that, because that lays a basis for an even more difficult question for you, Naomi, especially since you said in the chat, it's getting worse. I find this to be the most depressing conversation. I'm so sorry, but like all of it is just like, um, it's so complex because I think, you know, philanthropy tries to solve every problem with money, right? So when they feel caught out, they suddenly just like open the spigot and shower money on like a handful of groups that they, without very much knowledge, decide, okay, these are the groups that represent, right? And then that causes huge strife. And can hu- and because there aren't structures of accountability in a lot of these movements, and this is where I was like asking about the membership-based organizations, right? These are organizations where, you know, if the membership's not happy with the leadership, they have mechanisms to use, right? As opposed to kind of like an NGO structure where, People don't know who, how to hold people in, um, who are getting all the money accountable, right? And then there can be lots of bad blood and lots of, and, and, and movements can break apart, right? And we've seen that in every single context. But no, I mean, this mission drift issue, you, you know, Kumi, I mean, we're picking on, on Greenpeace, but like, hey, let's pick on 350. Kumi and I were on the board of 350 together, and we heard exactly that phrase, mission drift, when we talked about, well, why don't we, instead of just s- stopping things from getting worse, why don't we have, why don't we talk about how we make things better right now, right? And this, I think, Georgia, um, relates to this issue around urgency. It's like, if you're meeting people where they are, and the issue is like, how do we, you know, solve a water crisis? How do we, how, how do we improve your housing precarity right now? And at the same time, lower emissions, people are going to feel super urgent about that. It's when you come in and say, make my issue your urgent issue and override all of your other issues that people say, excuse me, who the hell are you? Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel this very intensely right now this week, I have to say, <laughs> because. Um, you know, the next climate summit starts in less than a month. It's happening in a police state. And Kumi, we've never missed you more in the, in the, in the international ENGO movement, because I cannot get 350 or Greenpeace to attention to listen to Egyptian activists who are saying, we have around 60,000 political prisoners in Sisi's dungeons. And you're all about to go to Egypt. And, you know, I, I did, did a live cast this week with an incredible panel of Egyptian activists, including Sana Saif. Sana is Ala Abdul Fattah's sister. She's been imprisoned around three times. She's only 28, you know. Um, and she was saying she's met with all these big ENGOs saying, will you please talk about political prisoners when you come to Egypt next month? And she says that they're telling her, we'll raise it privately. And she says, the State Department tells me that. What, what, what am I hearing from activists? You'll raise it privately. Raise it publicly, you know? And the idea, you know, coming back to what Laura was saying of, and what you were saying, Kumi, about, about human rights defenders um, being killed at this unspeakable rate. How is it possible that we, are, that we can't make the connection between defending human rights and climate action when this is happening, is this a hard thing to understand? <laughs> you know, um, but somehow we are three weeks away from a global summit in a police state, which is an unbelievable red line. And unless I'm missing something, I have not heard a single large green group connect the dots between these issues. And I'm just saying I, because like I've tried to write articles about this. I'm DMing people privately going, do you want to amplify this at least like a retweet? I can't even get a retweet from Greenpeace or 350 (laughs) on this issue. So I feel like we're going backwards, like in a huge hurry. Laura, I'm going to throw the question to you. Why is it we're not able to get the traction we need? Wow. Uh, Well, I don't know, but but let me tell you something. I think that... um, we're not getting the support because we are 
we are we're still trying to grapple our heads around how do we collaborate better uh and that that's something that that's at the core of um many of the obstacles and challenges that social movements are facing right now. It has to do with privilege and it has to do with who's receiving resources. And But those systems, because we live under these systems of oppression, we are still in a culture that's very more, much patriarchal uh, within our movements it, themselves. Um, so, so that's that's one one challenge. But I think that another challenge is to move us away from what Georgia was mentioning in terms of, um, you know, paying lip service or tokenizing ideas of intersectionality, and and even worse, just thinking that intersectionality is about bringing more people for diverse thinking. You know, it's really not about that. It's really about understanding that, for example, in a context like Brazil. We know that the right-wing forces are very much colluding, farming with militarization, with evangelism, uh, bueyes, uh, balas, y, y biblia in, 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 in Spanish or in Portuguese. Uh, that means that unless we understand, to Naomi's point about Egypt, that militarization is at the core of the fight for environmental justice, we're not going to be successful. We're not going to be successful if we don't put justice at the center of urgency, like, like Georgia was saying. So we need to understand from an intellectual perspective, but also from our hearts, that if we don't put people's justice at the very center, we're not going to really do the radical change that we need to rebuild the system here. Uh, for example, we are talking about energy transition, but in energy transition, if we don't put sacrifice zones to lithium mining as well, as the, at the very center of what's needed for us to rebuild the system, it doesn't matter how many electric cars uh, replace the other fossil fuel based cars. Uh, we will still be reinforcing the colonialist extractivist structures that are going to put us in where we are 20 years from now. So if, for example, in the hypothetical that we we give, um, we, we say to conservation um, uh, um, movements that are that are pushing for energy transition at any cost uh, and, and excluding communities, um, if we if we tell them okay well what's your long game you know i think that's when they when they when they don't find solutions because then they say well you know because of the urgency we just need to do this you know the, the, and and no we cannot we cannot continue reinforcing the type of mindsets that have put other people at peril and where we have sacrificed some individuals because it is at that sacrifice that we have that we came here and that we are where we are today, environmental destruction would not have happened at this pace or rate or situation if we had addressed colonial uh, con colonial structures before, if we had addressed racial justice before, because we wouldn't have allowed pipelines to go through areas where of black neighborhoods, right? So I think that's that's what we need to truly understand at the very core of our agendas and there's there's still challenges we are we're still thinking that we are in a, in a moment where we need to uh where we need to choose between agendas we cannot choose between agendas that's the very problem okay so georgia how does laura's reflections resonate with your experience they, re they resonate a lot and you know i was thinking Laura, listening to you and Naomi, what you were saying about Egypt is this kind of moment where people, it's its not a lack of information, where frontline activists, frontline communities are saying, hey, here's our power analysis. And people who currently have the power are saying, we don't agree. So we're going to continue gatekeeping. We're going to continue the way that we've done it, which I think we all know isn't working great, instead of instead of following through on, on what they're claiming to really wanting to embrace, which is intersectionality and taking the lead from frontline communities. And so I think 
I think there's a real need to kind of look in the mirror when it comes to giving up power and giving up decision making and say, if the if the frontline communities in Egypt are saying what we need to focus on is political prisoners, there shouldn't be these big NGOs saying like, well, actually, we're going to come anyway and have this other conversation that we're going to prioritize because our power analysis is, is more important or, or better than yours. To me, that is just replicating power, or the systems of oppression, replicating these racist tropes, replicating white supremacy and the ideas that we somehow, or they somehow know better than the people who are experiencing the day-to-day instances. And, and, you know, I couldn't, it resonated so deeply with me, Laura, when you talked about how if it weren't for white supremacy and colonialism and patriarchy, we wouldn't be in the situation we are now. That companies have been able to ex- to this idea of externalizing costs is just is just a different way of saying we don't care about black and brown people. We don't care about black and brown and frontline communities. We don't care about poor people. And I think I think it's the responsibility now of big NGOs like Greenpeace and to say we're going to do this differently. We're going to relinquish power and we're going to actually follow the the lead of, of frontline communities. Thank you, Laura. I mean, and do you think So, so, Georgia, do you have a sense, though, and and, uh, this is a question for all three of you, that the leadership of these critical organizations get it, intellectually at least, and that they are making efforts to change? What I will say is in in the work that Frailty Myths is doing around kind of advancing justice, you know, we've really kind of tried to pull back the conversation from the conceptual and the theoretical and really get into how we communicate with each other about difficult things, how we give up power and how we really listen to people. And what we have found is that I think there's definitely a, the desire is there, um, but there's also a frustration. And, and our analysis is that frustration comes from people not wanting to be uncomfortable and for particularly, you know, white men, but also white women and white institutions saying, yeah, but it's uncomfortable to give up power. So even though I'm against it, I'm I'm scared. And so I think that's one of the things that we're really trying to address with practice is people learn that their behaviors, even though they are, there is a difference between their intention and the real impact, the real negative impact they're having on our movements. Okay, great. I want to shift us now in the last 20 minutes to uh, and to address what you said, Naomi, we don't want folks to feel down because this topic was chosen and, and why I feel it's so central is because I see a lot of energy around it. Right? I see people making connections like I never dreamed uh, to see in my own country. You know, um, you know, even when the city council in certain cases is stealing all the money from the people, you're finding people are getting together across race, class, and other identities to say, okay, if the government can't do it, we'll build it ourselves, right? And, and you know, you, you're seeing bottom-up kind of intersectionality happening. So we, I think, have the momentum, but we don't have time, or we don't have sufficient time. You, and 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 <laughs> sorry, Georgia. I know this goes into a bit of a different narrative of how you use time as well. But I'm just saying what the science says, you know. Because I've and and all of us have been saying in one shape or form, is that uh, we are living in the most consequential decade in humanity's history. And what we do in the next, you know, we can't even say next ten years to be blunt about it, right? What we do in the next couple of years is going to determine what kind of future we will have, our children will have, and so on, right? And so uh, I want to pick up and put on the table an elephant in the room, right? And that is, we've talked quite a lot in this conversation about some of the internal dynamics and some of the subjective sort of weaknesses of our movements, our organizations, and so on. I want to just shift to the objective reality that prevents the kind of massive systemic and uh, change that we need. And, and I want to put the question about the media on the center of the table. Who controls the media? Who controls what people are being, you know, receiving and so on? And Noemi, if I can turn to you, given that you've had this uh, role at uh, Rutgers and you've done some thinking on it, uh, how are you looking at how we can break through what is 
a very heavily corporatized media in some cases, a state control media in other cases, depending on countries and so on. How do we break through that? Not just for intersectionality, mm. but for getting people to recognize that what's needed now is not system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. What is needed now is system mm. innovation, system transformation, system yeah, redesign. Yeah. I mean, I just want to, before I go there, on the, uh, I just want to pick up on a couple of things around, um, which maybe is a little bit less bleak than, than my, 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 my creed occur. I hope it sounded that way about, about, about the upcoming COP. Um, George mentioned the movement for Black Lives. Um, Laura mentioned um, Chile and, and, and the youth-led uprising. It's interesting because like, we're, we're trying to hold this balance around urgency and, and, the, uh, and the, the fact that we are in this, this terrifying period, right, where what we do matters so much, and the fact that urgency can be weaponized um, and be used to override uh, um, people's lived emergencies right now, right? Um, and and e- what's happening with Egypt is a really good example of that uh, um, because this is the reason why we, you know, Egyptians are being treated as a sacrifice zone in in their own country, right? As the international climate movement descends and says, "Sorry, we can't look at that um, uh, because it's just too important that we have this meeting." Um, but if we think about like. W- like what happened in 2020, like the largest protest in American history. I mean, there was no, like that was, that, that, like that, that, that happened because people felt a huge sense of urgency um, and something tipped and, 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 and we didn't see a big march, right? The climate movement can have a big march, but we saw an actual surging movement night after night, day after day, right? Um, and with this is after George yeah. Floyd's death, of course. Um, yeah. So it's not that people can't move fast. It's not that people can't move with urgency. It's like, what is the spark? Right. And, and, and when people are fighting right. for their lives, they fight with urgency. And, or, or, and, and so we can say intellectually, well, the climate movement is, is, is we're fighting for, for life, but people don't feel it in the same way as fighting immediate racist police violence. But if we think about Chile, it's always worth remembering, right, that what sparked this latest wave was Chile was supposed to host the COP, right? And their neoliberal right-wing government bought a bunch of green electric buses (laughs) to bring it back to what you were saying about lithium. But because they have within their constitution that they have to, any expenditure has to be uh, uh, paid for by consumers, they upped the price of public transit, right? Um, And it was that (laughs) that sparked a kind of revolutionary energy in Chile and people flooded the streets because they could not afford to have the price of the subway or the bus go up by a few, seemed like a few pennies to elites, but that is what sparked that, that original, uh, um, you know, that sense of urgency. And obviously it was students, it was feminists, it was that, but I, I just, I guess I just want to say that we are often told when we raise these issues, whether it's in the foundation space or whether it's at, at these big, you know, international NGOs, that we're slowing them down, right? <laughs> and it's just worth remembering, actually, that when you meet people where they're at and when you're, when, when you're, when you're acting on people's, you know, it, daily emergencies, it actually speeds things up. <laughs> um, things start moving very, very quickly in ways that, our like the, the 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 climate movement does not have the capacity to harness that kind of energy. It never has. The only thing it's ever been able to do is have a big march on a single afternoon. That is not the same. Um, so I think it's important that we push back on this idea that we're slowing anyone down by saying actually you have to meet people where they're at and 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 the daily emergencies. That's amazing, uh, Naomi. I fully fully um, support. And that resonates with me. So, uh, Laura, I'm going to come to you to, in the vein of how Naomi put it, what are your sparks? You know, what are the things that, you know, gives you the energy to keep going and you've been around for a long time? And then given that this is your, the last contribution as well, if you can also address the question of 
if you had the power to draft one clause in every country's social contract between the governments and the citizens, what would that one clause be? But start with the first question first. <laughs> What's your sparks? What's giving you hope? I'll, I'll start with where Naomi left off, which is that when we do things right, things speed up, actually. We're not slowing down by being inclusive or participatory. And in fact, uh, when, when we do that, things start to organically happen without much control, actually. And I'm inspired by, with this by the intelligence of how nature and natural ecosystems behave, for example, where everything is in interconnected, nothing is left out. If we miss out one piece of that ecosystem, everything is affected. And that intelligence of nature, of how nature is truly and, and uh, profoundly collaborative and innovative and and creative and, um, and, and, and where things are reciprocal in their behaviors, I see an interconnection between that and, and social justice movements practicing in a collective setting and collective organizing those, those principles. And when that happens, magic happens, change happens, because it is from those principles of collaborating together and leaving nobody behind looking at justice and practicing practicing that, that higher systems start shifting. Even though there's not a real sometimes connection between how how are we going to how are we going to address the climate crisis if we just work in this single community? But if if we pay attention to the way that in a single community we can start supporting alternative forms of living and that starts replicating, that's how change happens. Revolutions don't have a single leadership in charge, right? Revolutions start by practicing collectively principles uh, that 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 move us away from those systems that we're trying to change and and to that point uh, for your for your last question Kumi I would say um, that an, an eco-social contract must have the the principle that nothing about people should be without people uh, I think that uh, that level of participation uh, where people can uh, live, fully autonomous decisions and take those decisions at upper levels of systems and governments. I think that's where we are going to ensure that any solution to the climate crisis uh, comes with justice and the center and participation of people. And therefore, we're going to be able to address automatically the, the um, uh, solutions where we are not sacrificing people or sacrificing regions or doing the things that are going to take us to where we are right now, which is um, false solutions to the climate crisis, for example. So I would I would say nothing without people, nothing about people without people, and and also equality and justice at the center of climate solutions. Thank you, Laura. I'll come back to you if there's time, but Georgia, do you want to reflect on what would be your clause that would be a non-negotiable in an eco-social contract? Thank you for adding the word eco, by the way, uh, Laura. I said social contract, but you're right, <laughs> eco-social contract. <laughs> yeah, I think a new clause for me and kind of in the, in the line of frailty myths ethos is really rejecting the idea that simply turning the system upside down or replacing the people in it will change and instead deconstructing the system completely and building something new and better with, with the people most impacted at its center uh, and really kind of lifting up community agency. Thank you, Laura. Uh, sorry, thank you, jo uh, uh, Georgia. And uh, Naomi, to you? Well, I think I, I, I think I would want to underline an idea that I think is going to help um, help us weather the shocks to come <laughs> because we are in this era of, of serial shocks, which is that care work is climate work. Um, that the work of, of, um, of caring for, for elderly folks, for little kids, um, uh, um, being companions to disabled folks. Um, this labor is the most important labor of our lives. Um, it's the most undervalued uh, it is um, the most underpaid, if paid at all. 
Um, and it usually isn't part of our conversations about what a green job is. Uh, so uh, I think that could prove to be very important. Thank you, um, Naomi. I think what we find ourselves in right now is a moment where we are challenged to connect our different struggles, or we put it very simply, just connect the dots, and to resist the entrenched practices that have become normal for many of us that are on the right side of the struggles. So, so, so you know, we are in a very difficult position here. On the one hand, we have to get all those that genuinely recognize the urgency of the moment we're in to act better and to act more united and more intersectional and more boldly and so on. But on the other hand, we also have to recognize there's a whole bunch of people that are not in the conversation at all and are being pushed further and further away from us by a very frightening communications and media environment where people are being lied to left, right, and center, right? And, and, and you know, so I say something, yeah, and I want to invite a quick comment before oh. we round up, right? And I, I know this is an unpopular thing to say, but for, for some, I think if activism is going to succeed, if progressive activism is going to succeed, we will have to find a bridge, a narrative bridge to those that are not with us at the moment. We cannot, I believe, wipe out or write off the people that vote for Trump or the people who voted for Brexit or the people that are voting for Bolsonaro right now. We have to believe in the correctness of the values and the views and the positions that we are putting forward that we can win back people who have been lied to, manipulated, deceived, and so on. So it is in that context, I, I, I just give you two sentences each. How do we communicate better? How can we reach the people, and let's be blunt about it, most of the people that we want to reach don't know the word intersectionality. It's a jargon to them. We know that, right? How do we take that word and how do we make it more real for them? How do we get people, you know, and just to, and to put it in an optimistic note, somebody said to me the other day that actually don't assume that everybody that voted for Trump is a racist. Right, because or, or most of the people that voted for Trump were racist. Because if you go back and you look, that there was a high overlap between people who voted for Obama and then voted for Trump. Right, there was a large overlap there, and what that's telling you is that a lot of people have just fed up with the establishment. They fed up with the establishment, and when any anti-establishment figure appears, however obnoxious they might be, it just sounds refreshing. How do we deal with this dilemma? in the last minutes. One round of final comments and then I thank you for your amazing contributions and the work you do. Georgia, you go first. <laughs> sure. You know, I think that we need, um, I think we need a ca compassionate accountability. It is not to say that I think people um, should, you know, get, get kind of away with being racist or sexist, et cetera. But I do think as a, as a movement, and that movements generally need to have more grace and need to assume thoughtfulness first. Um, so, cause people are reacting out of defensiveness. If they feel like you're talking to them, like they are stupid or, um, you know, or that they are or, yeah. Or that they, that they are kind of inhumane in some way that people are just reacting out of people are reactive out of defending their personhood. And I think, if, if the objective is to reach them, that we need to start with, like, in, we need to start with rooting into humanity and assuming that people at their core um, are trying to protect themselves and their family. And I think there is connectiveness there um, and, and people are deeply wounded. And so I, I do think that that's a starting point. Might not be the ending yeah, yeah. point, but um, I do think that assumed thoughtfulness is, an, is a powerful first step. Thank you so much, uh, Georgia. Naomi? Yeah, I think um, I've spent unfortunate amounts of time in recent months for a book that I'm writing, listening to um, hours and hours and hours of one Steve Bannon's podcast. Um, uh, because uh, I've done it, so you don't Good have for you. to. Um, 
it's really, it's really chilling. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and he, uh, you know, and, and, and this isn't just about the U.S. because obviously Steve Bannon is very much an international figure. He was worked closely with with Georgia Maloney, who, Absolutely. who's, um, uh, you know, ascended in Italy and, um, and many other parties like Spain's Vox and so on. I mean, he really sees himself as building um, an international, um, what he calls inclusive nationalism. This is important. He calls it inclusive nationalism. He he is he has his own intersectionality, folks. He's weaving together everybody's hatreds um, into uh, a, a common common ground. And he sees tra- he sees he sees tra- attacks on on trans rights as being. Um, an absolute key to bringing more diversity into this project because he see, he, see, he saw how Bolsonaro used it in Brazil. Um, he sees it as being very, very resonant and it is. Um, and, you know, listening to Bannon, it is so clear that he is feeding off, as Georgia said, the failures of the kind of, of these, of, of this sort of weak sort of centrist politics, right? Um, and, and the, and the failure of an offer. Um, and so we just can't be afraid to offer something real in response. And this, he is conducting this popular rage. Um, there's a bait and switch where they claim that they're attacking elites, transnational capital, et cetera. Um, but then it, it, it pivots and directs it at the most vulnerable. Right. And so whatever we do, we have to understand that the rage is there and it needs to go somewhere. Um, and so we need to direct it at those structures of power that are truly failing people. Um, uh, uh, sort of liberal centrism and, you know, mushy middle, um, now just gets completely read as elitism, which it is, frankly. Um, so, yeah, I hope that's a little bit helpful. It's not easy. Not easy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Naomi. Uh, Laura? Okay, I'm ready now. <laughs> I think uh, I, I agree with my colleagues, and I would only say that um, – Perhaps, you know, to bring us back to where we're, what we're here talking about today, um, intersectionality is the protective shield against those intersectional right-wing agendas that Naomi was referring to and that I was referring to with happening in Brazil and happening in many other countries where, where church and corporates and militarization are working together against social justice movements. And I think that, um, what makes it possible for many right-wing agendas to win are actually the weaknesses of our uh, left agendas where we haven't really addressed, for example, elitism or social economic barriers for people even being left behind. And also mainstream media that you were referring to me has never really been truly about the stories of people in communities, Absolutely. right? We, Absolutely. We, and, and because of that, we are losing a lot of ground because if we if we start directing media and attention to stories that are not just about the single stories of heroes, but the stories of everyday people, everyday struggles, I, and and we and we include the agendas there, and we we let these folks drive the agendas. Uh, I think that it's it's going to be practically impossible for right wing folks to to um, turn things around and to manipulate the truth. And uh, because they're going to be in power, because they're going to be driving those agendas and those agendas will be uh, placed in in media and the attention of everybody else. Uh, I think that those are the gaps that are allowing the world to continue increasing fundamentalisms, increasing uh, militarization, authoritarianisms that we're seeing right now and that are affecting everybody. Thank you, Laura. Um, so to all three of you, Naomi, Georgia, Laura, thank you firstly for the work that you do. Uh, as you, I hope you know, your work inspires many, many people around the world. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for being open and talking about even the institutions that we've worked for or work along even today, to be open that you know, we have to listen to what Einstein once said when he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. 
we have to do what Amilcar Cabral, the leader of the uh, anti-colonial struggle in the small country of Guinea-Bissau said, freedom fighters should tell no lies and claim no easy victories. So we're not here about trying to say that we're doing better. So the purpose of this podcast really is about rethinking activism, being willing to say, if we're not as the best we can be when humanity needs us to be as best as we can be, then let's have conversations about it and let's look at how we can rise to the shortcomings on our side. But I think the one message in concluding that I'd like us to take from it is this last con conversation, which is how do we communicate with those that we disagree with, with humility, with kindness, with compassion, and with persuasion so that we can win them over. The idea that we can make the, to change everything, we need everybody, uh, as, as, we, as the slogan goes now, and we have to get smarter at how we broaden the tent and bring many, many more people into the, into the tent. So I want to end then by thanking all our listeners and viewers for joining us for this discussion. Please make sure to follow or subscribe and do all those things that you do by liking and all that. Uh, your support makes a difference. Please share the podcast wildly. Thank you very, very much. See you next week or see you soon. <laughs> Bye.